It's also part of our School of Design and the Built Environment uh, Advisory Board. Uh, so her title is Unpacking Cultural Heritage, where she explores key considerations and insights in adaptive reuse design on heritage places and opportunities for heritage best practice. Um, without any further delay, I would like to invite Flavia to perhaps give us a very short introduction herself as well and then uh, present. Thanks, Flavia. Thank you, Parisa. Um, I'll share my file now and hopefully sure. we'll go everything all right. You let me know if you um, um, if you can see it. Sure. Um, can you perfect. see it, Parisa? Yep, perfect. Yes. So um, I'm um, driving two computers here, so I hope I'll go well in the end. Um, uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for attending this webinar today. It is an honor to be here speaking to you about heritage. I am uh, Flavia Kieperman. I am descendant of the Piquerobi of Tupiniki people of Brazil's southwest. I would like to acknowledge the custodians of the land upon which I live and work, the Wadjuk Noongar people, and the traditional owners of country throughout Australia. I recognize their con continuing connection to land, waters, and um, culture, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present, and emerging. Um, these are only a few examples of my background experience in heritage. I started studying architecture because I wanted to be an interior designer. And that was my focus until halfway through the course. It all changed after I worked as a trainee architect on a Baroque church from the 1800s in Rio. And after that, my interest in heritage grew, leading me to complete, complete two masters by research on heritage management. My own practice in Rio started when I was engaged to restore 13 square meters, 13,000 square meters of a nationally listed colonial roof from the 1500s, and the, the rest now is history. I have worked on some of the most important tourist attractions in, and heritage buildings in Rio, Brazil, such as presidents, palaces, national museums, Baroque churches, forts, civic houses, and so on. My last project prior to embarking on a life-changing adventure of moving to Australia was the Sugarloaf Master Plan, um, where my practice prepared the restoration of four uh, 1960s cable car stations uh, prepared an interpretation uh, center and concept design of new structures in both mountains. Uh, 13, year, uh, 13 years later, and now as a principal and team leader element, I have had the opportunity to work on amazing projects all throughout Western Australia which I'm happy to share with you at another time. Uh, well, now enough about introductions and let's talk about heritage. Uh, so this is the outline of my presentation today. What is heritage? The levels of heritage protection, uh, her values, the Burr Tata 2013, and I'll present you two case studies. Uh, Cossack Town Site, Cultural Landscape Management Plan, and the Claremont Electrical Substation, Adaptive Reuse. So, what is heritage? For example, heritage is the well known opera house in Sydney, listed in the Australia Heritage Database, National Heritage List, and also in the World Heritage List. Or the less known convict fence located in the Canning River, which is believed to be part of a series of fence posts that were originally constructed by convict labor in 1866, 
to keep in place the navigation, navigation channel to enable timber to be transported down the river from Menzies landing, landing to Fremantle by barge. This fence is a, of exceptional significance for the city of Canning and Western Australia. It is registered in the State Register of Heritage Places and in the City of Canning Local Heritage List. As an example of the importance of this place, it should be retained and conserved in consultation with the Heritage Council of Western Australia. A heritage place has a broad scope and includes natural and cultural features. A place can be large or small. For example, a memorial, a tree, an individual building or a group of buildings, the location of a historical of an historical event, an urban area or town, a cultural landscape, a garden, an industrial plant, a shipwreck, a site within C2 remains, a stone arrangement, a road or a travel route, community meeting place, or a site with a spiritual or religious, religious connections. The Australian State of Environment states that Australia is a complex, layered set of natural and cultural landscapes in, in, in which unique geodiversity and biodiversity provide a palette for a nation and ongoing indigenous culture, European exploration, post-colonial history and more recent places of cultural value. Australia's heritage comprises natural and indigenous and historic places with intergenerational value that we have inherit, inherited and will pass it on to future generations. We are the custodians of those places. Australia has well-known, well-reserved uh, process for identification, protection, conservation and management and celebration of heritage, but requires more consistent approaches, standards and guidelines. Thorough and comprehensive assessments are needed to secure the adequate areas of protected land and comprehensive heritage inventories. The Australian State of Environment key findings highlight that Australia's extraordinary and diverse natural and cultural heritage generally remains in good condition. However, our protected natural and cultural resources do not yet comprise an appropriate set of heritage places. Australia's heritage registers list natural and cultural places at national, state and local levels, but in an inconsistent manner and with disparate levels of resourcing and regulation. This is the Howard Smith Wharves. It was previously an inaccessible historical site in Brisbane and it was abandoned since the 1960s. The site was originally built as the Brisbane Central Wharves and was then leased by shipping com company Howard Smith Co. Ltd. It is listed on the Queensland uh, Heritage Register of the Department of Environment and Science as a state heritage place. That means it has no values for the people of Queensland. The site is also subject to a heritage overlay and the heritage planning scheme policy of the Brisbane City Council plan, uh, the City Plan Heritage Register. Today it is transformed into a multi-use lifestyle de destination comprising of a multitude of retail spaces and generous public zones along the riverfront. The master plan celebrates the site's heritage by repurposing existing sheds, while the new buildings are designed to complement the original structures. There has been progresses, progress towards a more integrated tiered system of heritage management. There are many heritage lists in Australia with different names, such as register, inventory, surveys, some are kept by different levels of government statutory lists, while others are maintained by the community or professional organizations. Non-statutory lists, such as the National Trusts, uh, um, in, that they exist in most of the states and territories, the Royal Australian Institute of Architects, Engineers, Heritage Australia, and etc. The main ones 
Australia's World Heritage List, National and Commonwealth Heritage Lists, State and Territory Heritage Registers, and Local Government Lists, which are integrated into the planning systems. Natural heritage is generally identified and protected through national and state territory parks. Many indigenous heritage places are protected by specific state or territory legislation. Implications for heritage listing vary between governments. Generally, heritage listing provides protection for the place, focus on its heritage values or significance. Development of or planning approval process is taken and take, take account of the listing. In some cases, owners may also be eligible for financial or other assistance. This table shows all three levels of government, Australian or Commonwealth, state and territory and local. Each has a role in identifying and protecting heritage places. Some places may be important at more than one level, such as the Fremantle prison, which all levels of government share responsibility for protecting it. Fremantle Prison is on, on the World Heritage List, on the National Heritage List, State Register of Western Australia, and on the City of Fremantle's Local Heritage Survey and Heritage List. It has also been classified by the National Trust since the 1960s. So not every place has heritage value and not every place with heritage value has sufficient value to meet the threshold justifying the inclusion on a particular list. Criteria and thresholds are key tools used to help inform these decisions. Criteria are a collection of principles, characteristics and categories used to help decide if a place has heritage value. In addition to meeting one or more criteria, a place needs to have sufficient value to justify listing and therefore protection by a government, a threshold of significance. Um, as an example, Federation Square in Melbourne was entered in the Victorian State Heritage Register just 17 years after its completion. The push for the heritage status was provoked by the now abandoned Apple Store proposal for the city centre site. Federation Square met five of the eight criteria for identifying heritage significance. It met the criteria for aesthetic, historic, scientific, social and other special values to all generations. So the HERCON values uh, uh, are, the, are the values that we use here in Western Australia and most of uh, Australia. So the, the Heritage Act of 2018 um, enabled us in Western Australia to use the same set of values that the whole Australia uses. So while there are some minor differences in the wording of the statutory criteria used by governments, the Commonwealth states and territories have endorsed the HERCON values. It is the common criteria adopted by the Environment Protection and Heritage Council of Australia and state and territory governments in April 2008. It comprised the model criteria developed at a national heritage convention, therefore the name Heritage HERCON, in Canberra in 1998. The Heritage Council of Western Australia has adopted HERCON criteria to assist in refining the assessment of places for the register. The criterion listed in orange here appears in the Western Australian Heritage Act in 2000 extra, as an extra um, uh, criterion. And the other, the blue criterion, the ones listed in blue, are the ones in which the Federation Square has identified uh, heritage significance. So Federation Square, for instance, has importance to the course or pattern of a cultural or natural history. 
but it doesn't possess an uncommon, rare or endangered aspects of our cultural or natural history, nor potential to yield information that will contribute to an understanding of our cultural or natural history. Federation Square has an important is an important in demonstrating the principal characters of a class of a, or of a cultural or natural place or environment. It has importance in exhibiting particular aesthetic characteristics, has importance in demonstrating a high degree of creative um, or technical achievement at a particular period. It has strong or special association with the, a particular community or cultural group for social, cultural or spiritual reasons. This includes the significance of a place to indigenous peoples as part of their continuing and developing cultural traditions. Uh, the Hercon values has also two extra values, a special association with the life or works of a person or group of persons or importance in our history. And Western Australia includes any other characteristics they may have to, that in the opinion of the council is relevant to the assessment of the cultural heritage significance. Wadjamup Rottenness Island in Western Australia is of historical significance to the state. The island has an interesting architecture, history, ecological reserves, archaeology, and the level of value justifies state listing. However, it does not meet the threshold required for national or world heritage listing. There are 14 heritage listed places on the island, including the Gold Shed, Kingston Barracks, the Seawall Cemetery, Thompson Bay, among many, many, many others. One of the 13 statements of significance identified for Thompson's Bay, Wadjamup Rottnest Island, says that it collectively, that collectively the individual components form a cultural environment which possesses significant aesthetic qualities. They are heightened by the natural landscape and marine features. The place is unique in the way in which so many very significant cultural elements are concentrated in a single place. Similar individual attributes are found in many places, but the combination on Wadjamup, Rottenness Island, is unique. The Burtata process. The International Council of Monuments and Sites, ECOMUS, is a non-governmental professional organization formed in 1965 with headquarters in Paris. ECOMUS is primarily concerned with the philosophy, terminology, methodology, and techniques of cultural heritage conservation. It is UNESCO's principal advisor on cultural matters related to the world heritage. ECOMUS has over 10,000 plus members uh, in 131 countries formed international committees that participate in a range of conservation projects, research work, intercultural exchanges and cooperative activities. ECOMOS also has 29 international scientific committees that focus on particular aspects of the conservation field. I am the Western Australia representative in our national committee and part of the International Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscapes. I also represent Australia on the Climate Change and Human Rights International Working Groups. Australia ECOMOS act as a national and international link between public authorities, institutions and individuals involved in the study and conservation of all places of cultural significance. Australia ECOMOS members participate in a range of activities including site visits, visits, training, conferences, and meetings. The Burra Tata was adopted by the Australian National Committee of ECOMOS on 19th of August of 79 at Burra, South Australia. The Burra Tata provides guidance for the conservation and management of places of cultural significance, cultural heritage places, and is based on the knowledge and experience of Australian ECOMOS members. The Australia ECOMOS Bora Tata was revised in 2013. It's the widely accepted reference document for heritage conservation standards, philosophy and methodology in Australia. The Bora Tata principles lie behind many local planning instruments, policies and guidelines. 
local government planners, councillors, and other decision, decision makers are an advantage if they are familiar with the Borough Charter principles. So why conserve places of cultural significance? The Borough Charter states that places of cultural significance enrich people's lives, often providing a deep and inspirational sense of connection to community and landscape, to the past and to, lead, to the live, lived experiences. They are ex historical records, they are important expressions of Australian identity and experience. Places of cultural significance reflect the diversity of our communities telling us about who we are and the past that has formed us and the Australian landscape. They are irreplaceable and precious. This is the World Heritage listed Ningaloo Reef located in Western Australia's north west coast. It is listed for its interconnected ocean and coast, striking landscapes and seascapes. It is undoubtedly irreplaceable and precious. So the cultural significance of a place and other issues affecting its future are best, best understood by a sequence of collating and analyzing information before making decisions. This is called the Burr Chatter process. The Bayer-Tata process of sequence of investigations, decisions and actions is illustrated in more detail in the flowchart. Firstly, we need to understand the cultural significance, then develop policies, and finally manage the place in accordance with the policies. Policies should identify a use or a combination of uses, constraints on uses, and they retain the cultural significance of the place. New use of a place should involve minimal change to the significant fabric and use, should respect associations and meanings, and where appropriate, should provide for continuation of activities and practice which contribute to the cultural significance of the place. Article 22 of the Baratata discusses new works. An important factor in the success, success of new work is the quality and sensitivity of the design response. New work should respect the context, the strength and scale and character of the original and should not overpower it. The key to success is carefully considered design that respects and supports the significance of the place. Imitative solutions should generally be avoided. They can mislead the onlooker and may diminish the strength and visual integrity of the original. Well-designed new work can have a positive role in the interpretation of a place. Port Arthur, a place mostly in ruins, is listed by the World Heritage. The location of the cells in this image here are interpre interpreted on the ground and added structures are readily identified as new works. The Buratata underpins my work on a daily basis, especially the Buratata process for planning and managing places of cultural significance. I use the process to assess every place, from small one-room cottages to a whole town site. And I'm now going to walk you through the first stage of the process in this understanding significance. Work on a place should be preceded by studies to understand a place which should include analysis of physical, documentary, oral and other evidence drawing on appropriate knowledge and skills and disciplines. Uh, re regarding the case study of Corsac Town Site, although we undertook all stages of the Baratata process, my presentation today will be limited to a summary of the highlighted, the understanding significance phase. Corsac is located in one of the most ancient regions in Australia. The it was the first port in the northwest of Australia and was established there in 1863. The place encompasses Aboriginal prehistoric, British pioneer settler and Asian immigrant adaptations, making it a unique and rare cultural landscape. Managed by the government of Western Australia, the Naluma people hold the native title for the area. 
just as the Pilbara landscape is extremely ancient, so too is the Aboriginal occupation of the region. Archaeological sites dating as far back as 50,000 years have been discovered on the Northwest Cape. In order to develop the cultural landscape management plan for Corsac, the cultural significance of the town site and other issues affecting its future were understood by a sequence of collating and analyzing information before making decisions. This is the Bertara process. The conservation of a place should also identify and take into consideration all aspects of a cultural and natural significance without giving emphasis to any one value at the expense of others. Understanding Cossack's history was essential to preparing management policies for the place. As an example, in the 1850s, Cossack became the home of the first pearling fleets in Australia. It was an important contact point between pearling entrepreneurs and the local Aboriginal people, with many Aboriginals being involved in the pearling industry, either, by, either through choice or cohesion. The pearling industry will also attract or invo involuntary involved a considerable number of Southeast Asians, firstly Malays, a general term encompassing several different ethnic groups, mostly within the Dutch East Indies, followed by Filipino and Japanese divers. Many were purchased in the labor slave markets and, and by the late 1870s, Consact Cossack had developed a distinctively Asian quarter known as Chinatown. The town site still retained multiple built archaeological sites, including ruins of building market gardens and wells. Today, there remains a number of buildings, archaeological, maritime and Aboriginal sites, all of which have cultural heritage significance in their own right, as well as contributing to the heritage significance of Cossack as a whole. The place retains its ongoing association with the Aboriginal people of the area who, are, who have a continuing connection to country. This is one of the graphs on historical tropical cyclones in the area. And the 19, or 2019 cyclone Veronica path, Cossack stand, stands in the path of tropical cyclones that develop between the months of November and April. 48 cyclones have been reported in Corsac since 1910. Significant cultural resources are disappearing due to the, due to the high rates of erosion, inter, intense weather events, and other factors related to climate var variability and change. Human interference also impacts on the archaeological remain, as all-terrain vehicles drive over unmarked areas in archaeology. The place is a testimony to the rigors of frontier life, characterized by scarcity, climat climatic extremes, and the hazards of cyclones and tidal surges. The town was first destroyed by a cyclone in 1839. After a decade of British government attempting to establish a military outpost linking to Asia and India in the Pacific, the town site was abandoned. The town of Cossack was fully abandoned in the 1950s. Most of the lots reverted to the crown. Today, the place stands as evidence on, of an early multicultural society, demonstrating the cultural diversity of Aboriginal, European and Asian people, of all, whom, all of whom contributed to the development of Cossack and its industries. By understanding the significance of place, we can then make sure that conservation is an integral part of good management. The preparation of the Cossack Cultural Landscape Management Plan involved the collaboration of the City of Karata, the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage, Elements Heritage and Place Teams, MP Rogers Engineers with the preparation of a Coastal Hazard Risk Management and Adaptation Planning called CHARMA, the City's Aboriginal Reference Group and Yates Archaeology. The management plan, plan aims to provide a holistic framework and philosophy to allow change and future development. Now I'm going to talk about another project, which is uh, the Clement Electrical Substation Adaptive Reuse. 
Uh, Claremont Municipal Council Electricity Substation at 280 Sterling Highway was built in 1923. It was extended in 43 and would have been taken over by the State Electricity Commission in 1951. It was sold in 1985 and converted into a meat store, then used as a by Pizza Hut for storage and later becoming a bull repair style shop and workshops. Those uses posed many threats to the heritage fabric, including misuse, neglect, net damaging repairs and intrusive change. This is how the building looked like in the late 2017s. The Town of Claremont Town Planning Scheme makes provision for individual heritage protection of places through its schedule of historic and other building and places. It is included on the schedule as a category B place, which identifies it as being of, ex of considerable significance to the local community and its retention is therefore essential. The electrical, it says, the electrical substation is rare in that it was built and run by a local government as a small scale provider of a new form of energy at that time. It is a modest representation of an early interwar architecture. And this was the vision we presented to the clients. But to prepare that, we firstly needed to identify the areas and elements of significance within the substation. So we identified three levels of significance, the considerable significance, which, which is the front part of the substation and its elements, tin ceilings and original steam beams, steel beams. Little significance was a later addition at the back and intrusive, the shower room and the timber mezzanine added later on. So this is how we received the building and its interiors. The, to the right you can see uh, the shower uh, that was built later on and the timber mezzanine on the ground floor. They, they were both considered intrusive. That means that should be removed as soon as possible. Uh, here you can see uh, through the mezzanine, the timber mezzanine, the tin ceilings and the original roses. This is the access to the back part of the building and the south elevation roller doors. So then uh, we prepared a, a heritage adapted reuse to the place. And here I show a little bit of the process we went through with the client. So the pie chart shows the time spent on all phases of design. The client didn't know exactly what they wanted. It was vacant for a long time. So the, client, the clients wanted to have flexibility on the space. And we proposed them an industrial look for it because it fitted the, the the history of the place. This is just an example of one of the plans on the construction documentation package where we show what is to be removed and what is to be retained and how each part is retained and what should be done to each of the elements of the place. So um, we started with paint removal and repair of the stucco front and the top pointing. And it now looks much more elegant than with the orange and blue paint of the bow repairs. Um, this is the eastern facade with the steel windows replaced where it used to be the roller doors. Uh, allowing enough light in and contributed to the industrial aesthetic of the place. A little bit of the eastern uh, elevation as well, looking to Sterling um, Highway and the interiors after the mezzanine was removed. 
This is uh, uh, on the interiors, looking um, with the Sterling Highway to the back of us, uh, looking south. The overall result is a unique offering of heritage merit with finishes that are in keeping with its industrial style. Attention to detail in the new elements introduced to the place was maintained throughout. The new elements are easily identified following the Australian Ecomus Burratata. The double height void at the entrance combined with the pressing ornated ceilings and double height windows remain as, a high, as highlighted features. The project demonstrates expertise in understanding the building technologies associated with the specific building typologies and in designing new interventions that are not, not only respect the building considerable heritage significance but enhance its ongoing use. Now the building has a new life as a furniture shop. Some of the photos of the interiors. And it's open for visitation. You can go there anytime. It's a beautiful. So my take home messages from this presentation are that we are custodians of, the of our heritage places for the next generations. We need to look after them. Heritage can be large or small, tangible or intangible, and it can include natural and cultural features. We always need to understand the history and significance of the place before development of policies for management or change or, or adaptive reuse suggestions. And any new work should respect and have minimal impact on the cultural significance of the place. Here I have some useful websites that you might um, want to read further of things that I've spoken throughout the, the webinar. And, you, and please contact me if you need, if you have any queries or if you need any, any explanations or anything. Thank you. Thanks, Flavia. Um, thank you very much. That was brilliant. Uh, thanks for sharing your uh, beautiful projects and experiences with us. I think Nat has a question, perhaps. Um, we can't hear you, Nat. The questions are coming through, yeah. but I, I, how do I read them? No, uh, no, no, no. I, oh. I think he's going to use his um, microphone. Nat, please go ahead. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to thank you. Um, just everybody knows that Flavia has uh, also been involved in the school-wide advisory, so it's really good to see her voice in this platform. I know this is a, um, it's really an initiative of the architecture course, but I think it also speaks to a lot of the cross-disciplinary worlds that we exist. Um, if you look at, listen to what her presentation, I do think the unique conversation around First Nations engagement in history, uh, and as well as the uh, the notion of what history looks like in this context, and also the breadth of her uh, impact, both as a someone that deals with architecture, interiors, as well as planning, is really a, a great thing. So my my question for you, I mean, well, Flavia, is when you think of your disciplinary path, what is your sort of? I mean, you could talk about your root training, where you see yourself. Or how do you deal with uh, yourself abroad, those disciplines, uh, across all of those disciplines? Um, it's an interesting question, uh, Nat, because um, in some places elsewhere in the world, if a place is a heritage listed place, that uh, the architect or the engineer, need, lead engineer or lead architect needs to have heritage uh, expertise to be able to to deal with that place. So if you think um, of our, of all our Aboriginal heritage we have here, uh, we need to have someone, a traditional owner, leading the the, the 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 works because they are the ones that they understand the values of the place. So um, 
where do I see myself? Um, um, here we act more as a subconsultant to to an architect or to engineer or to an alliance or to a group of of developers, and we try to recommend and show them the importance and value of heritage. And it's up to the decision maker in the end to accept and, and respect that advice and proceed with uh, in, through design and, and development. Um, so where do I see myself? I see myself trying to advocate for Australia's heritage, Western Australian's heritage, and try to preserve the little brick piece of brick, the little piece of timber where I can to our future generations. So I see myself as a custodian of Western Australian to future generations. That's where I see myself. Great, thanks. Thanks it's good to hear. Thanks, Flavia. Um, we have a question from um, Professor Rina Tivari. Thanks for the presentation. Since you have worked on Aboriginal heritage, I was wondering if you could throw some light on the effectiveness of the new heritage bill um, that has been introduced in uh, the wake of Rio Tinto's destruction of the Jokan George for protecting places covered under the Aboriginal Heritage Act 1972. Hello, Rina, and uh, you put it on, you put me on the spot to respond that <laughs> one. I should have prepared myself and brought all my notes on that one. Um, so my point is that uh, the Aboriginal Act is long due for revision and update. It's a 1972 Act. It's 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 almost my age, so uh, it should be replaced, and it should be replaced as soon as possible, because the way the way it addresses Aboriginal heritage was one of the reasons why it happened. Uh, what happened at Jokan Gorge. Um, it's not only the Aboriginal Act's fault, it's a, it's a, a consortium of, of issues that happened that. Um, I wish the Aboriginal people had more voice and had a stronger, a stronger say um, on their protected areas. But I think the the bottom line, the bottom issue there is that we need to register as many places as we can. And by registering them, we would have analyzed their significance and put a values to it. So something like the Duke and God would not have happened if that was properly assessed and identified the, the extreme value, the, the exceptional value that the Duke and God had, and probably this wouldn't have happened. So I think, and and following from Nat's question, I tr that's my role as a, a heritage professional in Western Australia to advocate and and to to bring the heritage value, original heritage archaeological heritage, any heritage values to the fore and give them the correct um, uh, significance to, to, to us and to the future generations. But I'm just a one person trying to, we need everyone to be on board on that, I think. Thanks, Flavia, thank you. Um, we have another Flavia. I'm just guessing it should be Associate Prof Flavia Marcello, but I'll let her to introduce herself yeah. and uh, talk. Flavia, am I guessing right? Yeah, you are. It's me. Oh, great. <laughs> Good to digitally uh, meeting you, Flavia. Uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I, used, I should have put Flavia Marcello and then I pressed send and I thought, oh, there's another Flavia here. I should have pressed <laughs> Hi, Flavia. Um, to me, Flavia. I'm a Roman Flavia as opposed to a Brazilian Flavia. But um, yes. yeah, look, I've got a question about, like, you know, I um, 
fully respect you as an expert and these bodies of experts that determine heritage value. Uh, but I want to know, like I'm interested in how more bottom up processes are incorporated in the process. So we might decide because we've got the history and we've got the experts and we've got the, you know, the knowledge, what is value. And it's, it's a very kind of, I guess, hegemonic way of deciding what is heritage. I wanted to know what's actually been happening in heritage circles to bring the voices in of, you know, minority groups or um, non-experts that something that, you know, some white person would think was of value, um, you know, to say a, a group of Syrian refugees might have another kind of value. So how bottom up processes and the voices of non-experts being incorporated in, um, in heritage processes? Um, e-commerce and and um, and uh, and West and and the Heritage Council here, Western Australia, they are um, advocating for bottom-up process for a long time. Um, mm. E-commerce, for instance, has the 2012 uh, Hull Historic Urban Landscapes Processes and Framework. It shows that consultation and engagement is the basis for any development, any change you're doing to heritage practice. So to heritage mm -hmm. building, sorry. So it's a very interesting report that I recommend everyone to read. It was used here in Ballarat in Australia and as a case mm -hmm. study. And I recommend it. It's on my list of um, uh, useful websites, I think. But okay, the good. whole process is a process that uses the bottom-up process or bottom-up framework. Um, as an example for Western Australia, I am currently working in two projects where we are engaging with traditional owners before even planning starts. So we are listening to the uh, traditional owners and, and knowledge holders before we do anything with the project. And they are two public governmental projects that I'm working on now that we are engaging. And first, we talk to um, elders first. The elders then suggest us a group, a reference group for us to discuss with them. And then after having many workshops with the elders, uh, the, with the reference group, we then involve all the designers of the place and after that, we start discussing design. So it's a very interesting approach where it's making a lot of um, change, which I'm quite happy to be part of. Flavia, you coming from another place as well. You, my first job here in Western Australia, I've, I've, my first day of work, I was assigned to this state heritage listed property. And then I said to my boss at that day, uh, my director at that stage said, OK, so who is your archaeologist in this project? And he said, what? And I said, oh, so who is your indigenous consultant in this project? And he looked at me and said, Flavia, this is Western Australia. So I left and went home and I was sure I wasn't going to get the job after that. Because for 13 years has passed and I can safely say that 80% of our jobs involve traditional owners or archaeology or all of those. So I think that's the beauty of Australia and that's the beauty of Western Australia. We are looking to the future and we are trying to preserve and save cultural places for our future generations. We're doing our, the best I can, I think. The best yeah, look, I think it's all of this consultation with Indigenous groups is really, really important. But I was thinking more like other like minority uh, groups, like as in non-white migrants, because, you know, you know, in Australia has this like subdivision between uh, all the white people who came here with colonialism and then all the uh, everyone else is a migrant. Um, so I was just wondering, like, you know, smaller community groups, like lo like anything like like a local, a local mosque, which was, you know, 
formerly in an, in, a, in an electricity substation or like the voices of other minority communities. I'm, I'm not um, in any way saying that the Indigenous voices are not important. They're extremely, extremely important. But I wonder if heritage is going beyond the nanas in cardigans and um, actually embracing other kinds of community groups as well that maybe haven't been here as long as Indigenous people. Um, maybe they just arrived as refugees 10 years ago. Are their voices also um, being incorporated in heritage processes? So the cultural landscape management framework, cultural landscape framework, it involves you need to consult with everyone that was identified as a stakeholder. So for right, Corsac, yeah. we identified Afghans and we identified the Chinese, the Japanese and all them. So, and those people are still, some of the families are still there. So then we prepared a framework for ongoing consultation and, and stakeholder uh, understanding. Mm -hmm. Um, I totally agree with you and, and I think it's our duty to raise this and, and as I said that uh, the Beratata process with identifying significance and I think that's where you identify who are the correct people you should be talking about that particular project. Thanks, that's, that's really good to hear. Thank you. Thank you both, Flavia. <laughs> um, I think Justin Oven has a question. Justin. Hi, Flavia. Thanks a lot. That was really Hi. fascinating, um, brilliant talk. I was just going to ask him. He muted himself, I think. Yes, Justin. Yep. Oh, I muted myself. Probably <laughs> a good thing, actually, in many ways. It was just a quick question, which was sort of partly goes back to Roman Flavia's comment in a way about the hegemonistic um, position of particular groups of white settlers, because these are the two examples I'm going to use. But I went to visit Ellensbrook House and also Wannerup House. But what really surprised me about those two sites coming from um, a country that's sort of, in many cases, parts of it are set in aspic in terms of relationship to heritage, but there's been a more nuanced conversation in the last 20 years is how little they're visited by people in terms of being popular sites of, you know, looking back to critical aspects of the past in Western Australia. And I was just surprised by how little people seem to be interested in the heritage of this place outside the very good work that you do and a number of people, other people do. And whether there was any way we can actually, or there should be some way of making these sites, whether they're that kind of white, Anglo-Saxon kind of heritage sites or any other sites more, more, more sort of available to people to, to actually visit and be informed by. That's an interesting question, Justin, because I think it gets down to people and we are populating Western Australia. So I think in 200 years time, we might have a lot of people that will visit those places and we'll have enough people to to yeah. <laughs> have enough interest in the variety of not just going to the beach and, and, and swimming and probably will raise the interest of heritage places. Um, it's interesting, I visited um, Hayden and the Wave Rock as a good, as a good immigrant and I arrived there and I said, right, is that it? Where is the, where is the, uh, where are the original stories of this place? Mm. And then someone lit, led me to Mulga Cave to 18 kilometers from, from the Wave Rock. There was no one there. Wave Rock was packed. There wasn't a place to park and packed of people. And Mulga Cave, there was no one. We stayed there. No one showed up. And I was thinking, how come there were um, archaeology that back dating 12,000 years and no one was there? Mm. So um, I find it intriguing as well, Justin, and and I don't know how to respond to no, you. No, no, no. I mean, I, I, the other thing that really interested me, and I was having a chat with somebody about this yesterday, was that you talked about up at Cossack and four-wheel drive vehicles obliterating the landscape and in the Pilbara sort of huge scrapes of earth with an iron ore um, 
minds obliterating the landscape and it's that sense that, that I had when I first came here was the past is literally sw slipping into invisibility by being erased so quickly I don't know how to respond as well and that's I think if uh, that's as I said um, earlier I try to save every brick and every little piece of timber I can um, if I could save one more brick I'm happy hmm. and that my approach. That, Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Justin and Flavia. Um, I think the, um, I'm just checking the chat box and um, there are lots of thank you messages for you, Flavia, uh, but no more questions. I think um, I would just like to appreciate once again for your time and uh, I'm pretty sure we'll see you uh, at different stages this semester because um, if the participants don't know, actually Flavia uh, has been um, one of the greatest contributors to our course um, for urban, complex uh, studios, different reviews, and also, as uh, Nat mentioned, across the school uh, as part of our advisory board. Um, so thank you so much for your ongoing uh, contribution. You're welcome, Paris. Thank you, Flavia. Yeah, you're Thank welcome. You. I will um, upload the recording of the presentation on uh, Architalk website. So if anyone is interested to um, re-watch this presentation and the previous presentations, please feel free to go to architalk.org. And we will be updating the website soon for the next presentation. Thank All you right. so much, Thank everyone. You, no Thank worries. You. Have a great day. Bye. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.